motor neuron disease, it falls under rare disease. Currently in the UK, there are 5,000 people that are uh, living with motor neuron disease. There is a one in 300 uh, risk in life that someone could get diagnosed with the disease. And the incidence, so the yearly diagnosis is one to two cases per 100,000 people. But the prevalence, so the people currently living with it, is six cases per 100,000 people um, living with motor neuron disease. So that's why it falls under kind of rare uh, disease. Nonetheless, it's still a devastating disease that requires all our efforts. Hello, science lover. This is Cyport Chat, a podcast where we explain science puzzles in a way everybody understands. This podcast is brought to you by STEM Duardo. The goal of STEM Duardo is to make learning fun and interesting for kids. The games and exercise on STEM Duardo are fun and help kids learn math and science at the same time. I'm your host, Dr. Bishit Puddar, a scientist with more than 12 years of research experience in cancer disease. Today, we are joined by Dr. Duhe Taha, a neuroscientist who has traveled to Italy and then to London to study brain cells. Now, she is working at the Francis Crick Institute, working on a brain condition called motor neuron disease. She is also a TED Talk speaker. Let's hear from Dr. Taha about her exciting work. Without further ado, let's dive into the episode. Uh, welcome to my podcast. Uh, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you, Visha? I'm good. I'm happy uh, that you are here today to discuss about your research and talking about science. So, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning that we're going to talk about today, motor neuron disease, is it? Yes. Okay, good. Can you tell me about uh, what is actually motor neuron disease? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so, to start with, motor neuron disease falls under the umbrella of more bigger term, which we call a neurodegenerative diseases. Right. So, a neurodegenerative disease means is the death of a subpopulation of neurons. Mm -hmm. And as you know, and the listeners also know that each subgroup of neurons in our brain are responsible for a specific function. Right. So I just stop you in here. Can you mention what is neuron actually? Probably some audience, they would not know what is neuron. Oh, yeah. So neuron is the... So in our brain, we've got millions of neurons that what they basically do is that you're responsible for sending the orders mm -hmm. for our body to function. Right. So you can think about everything that we do, even blinking, mm. even in our sleep. The brain doesn't sleep. Right. Basically, uh, neuron, you are mentioning that neuron is communicating in our body to different organs. Exactly. It's okay. like the maestro of the, the whole body. It's the one that controls everything that goes on in the body. Right. And it sends the orders to harmonize the functions between the different organs in our body. Right. Okay. So, as you're mentioning about the motor neuron disease, uh, so can you go into de more details? Yes. Yeah. So, the thing with motor neuron disease, motor neurons, the word motor comes from movement. Mm -hmm. It's like explained, like it's like a motorway, for example. Right. So, when we talk about motor neurons, these are the subgroup of neurons that are responsible for any type of movement in the body. Mm -hmm. And in order to send the, they are connected to the muscles, and the muscles in our body, any muscle in our body its function will be movement contraction and right. relaxation mm. so these neurons are connected to those muscles and they send orders to these muscles to contract and relax and then that will perform a function a specific function whether this function is walking talking mm -hmm. breathing eating all of that requires an action of muscles to be able to perform this function yeah uh, you basically any kind of uh activities exactly in human life exactly this is all controlled by the motor neurons in the brain and mm. in the spinal cord so my next question uh, lead to that how common motor neuron disease uh, in human population it's a rare disease yeah so in the uk right now there is 5000 people with 
motor mm-hmm. neuron disease the the chances in a lifetime is one in 300 or 400 mm-hmm. to get uh, the disease and the prevalence is one people in a hundred thousand right people. so it's quite rare but the problem with it it's a quite a devastating disease so to explain what happens with uh, in a motor neuron disease mm-hmm. is that, as I said, the connection between the motor neurons and the muscles are vital mm-hmm. for the function of our body. So what happens in that disease is this connection, basically. So the neurons are mm. no longer attached to the muscles. So meaning they cannot communicate. They cannot communicate. Right. And then the muscles, when they don't receive any signals from the neurons, what they happen is they start to waste. It starts with stiffness and weakness. Mm-hmm. But after a while, the function, because they're not receiving, they don't know what to do. They start, this function starts to go away. So, and why is it that there is no connection anymore between the neurons and the muscles? It's because the neurons start to die. Oh, okay. So why they start to die? That's a very good question. And mm-hmm. this is ex- exactly what we're trying to understand in with the research that we do. Mm-hmm. We know that there are genetic factors that contribute to the onset of a motor neuron disease. Yeah. But we know that there is like common cellular hallmark. What I mean is that when we look under the microscope mm-hmm. at a very, very tiny level, look at the single cell or the neuron itself, mm-hmm. we do see that there are proteins that are not where they're supposed to be. You mean that they are dislocated? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, you know, in a cell, you do have a nucleus and that nucleus is like the vault. It's like Mm. what contains the DNA and it contains the most precious thing for the cell. Right. It contains the codes that give the cell orders to Mm. do everything that we know how a cell functions. Yeah. So then there are some proteins that are normally should be localizing in the nucleus, Mm -hmm. but what we find is that or they shuttle between the nucleus and the cytoplasm so they go outside the nucleus but then they come back right in motor neuron disease what we often find or something that we call a hallmark hallmark is like a very evident phenotype yeah. or that we observe in majority of cases it's in 97 percent of the cases of als mm-hmm. and i'm gonna call it motor neuron disease but i'm also gonna refer to it as als, ALS. and use them interchangeably yeah. these mm-hmm. two terms what we often observe is that this protein, particular proteins, are mislocalized. So they go to the cytoplasm mm-hmm. where there are the organelles. Oh, I have questions. Is there any specific proteins or a group of proteins or one single protein? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so far we know that there are new protein. The main one that has been described a lot in the literature mm-hmm. is an RNA binding protein. Right. So it's a protein that its function is to bind the RNA. It also has a function in binding to DNA, but mainly RNA. Mm-hmm. This protein is called TDP43. Okay. And we found, or the scientists found, that this protein is, rather than doing its normal function of shuttling from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, it goes to the cytoplasm and it stays there. Which okay. makes... It alarms the cell. So it was supposed to be like moving or it shouldn't be in the cytoplasm stuck, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Because it's a, it takes the RNA out of the nucleus to mm. the cytoplasm and then goes back okay. to get more RNA out to the cytoplasm. It's like a bus. Okay. It's meaning that like like the protein is not working anymore. She just like stuff something happened in the engine of the bus exactly right. exactly and okay. not just that it's, this is actually a very scientific term that we use okay. which is loss of function yes because then if you have a bus that moves from its first stop to the second stop but doesn't go to the first stop to pick people mm. then you lost the function yeah. of that bus but not just that okay you fill the space for the second bus that was coming to the second station right so then it's crowding the bus stop, the second bus, yeah. bus stop, because it's not going anywhere. So it's already disorganized things. Exactly. Okay. It's yeah. alarming the cytoplasm that this protein has been stuck here. Mm. And then a lot of proteins become come together and they make this aggregate. And the cytoplasm doesn't like aggregates. Yeah, right. It's completely chaos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you don't only just have a loss of function from the nucleus, but these aggregates starts to overload the cell mm. because the cell want to get rid of them right. of this waste mm-hmm. that is there and that makes a lot of pressure on the cell itself and okay. these aggregates as well start to become toxic to the cell uh, it's toxic for what so it releases different kind of toxic products or metabolites it also that's it doesn't 
it doesn't do that but it also it attract like it grabs other rna that could mm. be in the cytoplasm so it disrupts their function okay it overloads the machineries in the cells that are responsible for getting rid of proteins that accumulate for a long time all of that makes it a bit of a toxic environment right so you don't only have a loss of the proteins function from the nucleus mm. but you also have these aggregates that now have a gain of toxic function i see in the cytoplasm right so yeah it's, it's kind of misregulation of those proteins exactly and then it makes chaos yeah right okay so thank you so much for explaining uh, what is actually modern neuron disease so my next question is so why is happening so what's the me- uh, reason is there any genetic factors environmental factors or any mechanical factors so what's the reason basically to get modern neuron disease yeah so we know that it's uh, the main factor of this disease is aging so we do observe it in starting from 50 onward that mm-hmm. being said there has been reports of quite younger cases okay. of ALS um, we can some of it can be accounted for by genetic mutations so basically the DNA that I was talking about this code if there is anything wrong with that code it won't work properly and right. it wouldn't generate the right proteins yeah so in that case there is around 10% of the cases of ALS that could be explained by genetic mutations mm-hmm. but the others 90% of the cases cannot be explained by genetic mutation merely because when we say genetic mm-hmm. mutation or we call it familial mm-hmm. it means that we know that someone's that in the patient history family yeah, history, history. Yeah. there is someone in their family that had ALS right but sporadic or the which is 90% of the cases someone might be diagnosed with ALS but mm. n- no member of their family had ALS before right because we know that anything in the genes can be passed down definitely yeah but sporadic some people can have the disease but mm. we don't know but without any family history yeah but now we know that some of the genes that we discovered in familial cases are actually also mutated in sporadic cases as well okay yes I see. So you mean that like anyhow, even though they don't have the family history, but the gene can be muted exactly in sporadic conditions. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so my next question is, so how frequently people are diagnosed uh, with motor neuron disease? So people, I don't see many people, they know about the motor neuron disease. Probably many of my audience in here uh, they don't have any idea about motor neuron disease. So how common that people are aware about the motor neuron disease? Do you have any uh, ideas? Or? Yeah, because it's it's a rare disease. Yeah. I don't think many people know about it. Although we do know of a lot of famous, a few famous people that actually are like got diagnosed with motor neuron disease. Okay, or can ALS. I name them? Like Stephen Hawking. Oh, yeah. This famous yeah. scientist who actually is got diagnosed quite early on in his life with motor neuron disease. Right. Louis Garrick, the famous baseball player, which mm. actually the disease is named after him. Okay. And as I'm sure people also know George Wilson, mm. Dodie Weir, the famous uh, Scottish rugby player, mm. was also diagnosed with motor neuron disease. So there are it is there, it's just because it's rare people might know about it but it's quite a devastating disease that i think it's important to increase awareness about it mm. because it really not only affect the patient life by slowly losing control and losing movement and losing breathing and sleeping and all of that but it's also affect the carers around uh, the patients okay so thank you so what is uh, typically uh, the disease progress in a patient so let's say they diagnose in early stage and then what could be the consequence in the later stage of the disease so usually patients will go to the clinic with having problems like just stiffness of muscles mm-hmm. maybe they start tripping maybe things start to fall off their hands more often so they go to the clinic with these symptoms but it usually takes quite a long time to get diagnosed with a form of motor neuron disease because right. there are different forms and the diagnosis can take around a year mm-hmm. and from that actually once you get the diagnosis the disease is quite progress like it progressed quite rapidly oh. so within the span of three to five years the patient lose the ability to breathe wow yes 
So it's really surprised me, like within three to five three years. Three to five years. Wow. Mm, okay, interesting. Um, so, as you are working on uh, modern year needs right now, right? Yes. Okay. Um, what are some of the most promising areas of research in MND currently, and what you're doing? Can you explain uh, yes. for our audience? So. I work in Enrique Petani's lab, and in our lab, we model uh, neurodegener- motor neuron disease. So we're trying to understand the disease mm-hmm. using human stem cells. All right. These stem cells, we get them from patients. Okay, can you tell me what is stem cells? <laughs> <laughs> so stem cells are very amazing cells in our body. Okay. They, they have the ability to become, their potential is is the sky basically they can become any cell in our body okay and this was actually a discovery by um, china yamanaka actually that he got the nobel prize for it so essentially he found a way that we can just take skin cells Mm -hmm. from patients and from healthy donors and then they can be reprogrammed into these stem cells meaning the skin cells or any cell in the body at an adult in an adult mm-hmm. at that stage the cells know what they're doing a skin cell knows its function a liver mm-hmm. cell knows its function a neuron knows its function yeah and there's no turning back from that mm-hmm. what happened is that if you turned on four genes yeah in those cells they go back to a stage in which they can they have the potential they have the capacity they have the plasticity yeah to become again any type of cell in the body wow amazing which is amazing yeah because it allow us not to just we then take these cells mm-hmm. and then we take them down the path so we took a skin cell yeah we turn it into a stem cell mm. and then we start to give it small molecules All right to direct it toward the path of making neurons mm-hmm. and this would allow us to study the disease with the genetic background of the patient All right in a very non-invasive way to the patient mm-hmm. So in our lab, we take these cells, we culture them in our right. dishes, mm-hmm. and we're able to reproduce the phenotypes that you, are found in the You patient. take neuron stem cells? We take just a stem cell. Yeah, okay. After it's been reprogrammed from a skin okay. cell, mm-hmm. and then we put small molecules right. to the final destination is that these cells become neurons. Oh, I see. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so you're taking skin cells and converting into neuron? Yes. Wow. Okay. Cool. And then what do you do with this model? And then it's a model that it would allow you, allow you to look inside each cell. For us, the main goal is to find exactly what's going on or what is going wrong in mm-hmm. these cells at a very cellular and molecular level. All right. And see if there is any proteins or any RNA or anything that changes between a patient mm-hmm. neurons and a healthy neuron so that we can use them as a targets for therapy. Right. That's the final goal that right. we want to achieve. So basically what you are doing in the lab, as I understand, if I'm wrong, please correct me. So you are making a model. So you just try to um, uh, mimic a human kind of model. So and then you want to check what's going wrong and you try to um, find out new therapy. Probably uh, it can be used for motor neuron disease. Exactly. So you just, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of tool um, to study motor neuron disease, It's a right? tool to study motor neuron disease and it's a tool to study also, the main thing is to study early events in right. motor neuron disease because mm. that would help immensely with early detection and mm. early diagnosis because that what we really need yeah definitely otherwise as you mentioned uh, uh, the the disease progression is quite fast it's yeah. in three to five years so the loss completely uh, their moment of any, any yeah. kind of functions what is the complexity and challenges in motor neuron disease the complexity and challenges is exactly the um, i would say multiple events mm-hmm. like at a cellular level, there is a lot that is happening. Yeah. You've got a lot of stress in the cell. Right. You've got oxidative stress. You've got the powerhouse of the of the cell, there is, which is called the mitochondria. There is a dysfunction within mm. this, the, the function of this organelle. So there are so many things, so mm. many organelles that are suffering. Yeah. And there is misregulation or dysregulation of the RNA shuttling, as I mentioned earlier. So the, st- the problem with what makes it quite complicated disease is try to 
really understand what is the primary event and what happens, what actually triggers all this cascade of events. Yeah, that's the, that's the fundamental question. Yes, yeah. because if you can find that, if you can stop it, you can stop all the downstream effects. Right. And this is what we're trying to really understand, like what triggers this mm. disease? We know you have the mutation. All right. You know it can affect the proteins, but the the there is like we know A and we mm. know Z. All right. But all the steps in between, mm. we're still trying to understand. All right. Okay. So basically, you are trying to understand uh, what uh, what are the main um, culprit uh, to induce these modern neuron yes. disease. So you study mostly in protein or also you study in the genetic level? We're studying the messengers of the genes. So mm. basically we're studying, we know that the genes have a mutation. They get um, transcribed into a smaller code, of mm -hmm. what we call it an mRNA. Right. And that mRNA is what makes the protein. Mm. And we usually study the interaction between the mRNA and the protein and how this interaction can exacerbate or uh, the, the disease itself. Right. So I was listening to your um, uh, TED talk. You are um, heavily mentioned about astrocytes. Yeah. So I'm really interested to know more about uh, astrocyte. <laughs> so yeah, can you tell me more about yeah, it? Yeah, astrocytes have been the focus of my research for quite some time now. And basically... I've been actually talking about neurons this whole time. Yeah. And because we know that they're the one that they're connected to the muscles and connected to, to the movement yeah. of, um, of the body. But then there are so many other cell types in the brain. It's not just yeah. neurons in the brain. Okay. There's a lot of supporting cells in the brain. As okay. Well. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm learning neuroscience. <laughs> it's like they used to. Back the like back in the days, they used to call them glial cells mm -hmm. because they thought that their function is just merely like a glue. Okay. Like making the neurons connected, connected to each other, and yeah. that's it. Just a glue. Wow. But actually, they have more of a function than just being a glue. Mm -hmm. And there are so many of them. What are they? Though, so we've got astrocytes. There is oligodendrocytes. There are pericytes. There's a lot more mm. than just one, human, yeah, yeah. one cell type. Yeah. It's just a kind of complex environment in our brain. It's a very complex environment. Yeah. Yeah. And actually the ratio to the neurons and astrocytes the, in evolution, mm. the more you have astrocytes than neurons, that's actually a sign of evolution. Wow. Yes. So they are very important, not just as a glue, but to everything for emotions, for perception, for sleep. For the neurons to do their proper function, yeah. you need those supporting cells. So yeah. what is an astrocyte, basically? We call it an astro. Astro means star. Site mm -hmm. means a cell. So it's a star-shaped cell. Okay. And it's always found in a close proximity to the neurons. Because they are helping um, to neurons. Exactly. Okay. They, maintain, they make sure that neurons can do their proper functioning. They knew the neurons have a big, big responsibility. Mm -hmm. But you have to, like, we have to understand that with without the proper functioning of the supporting cells, yeah. these neurons won't be able to function as well. Right. So they provide them with nutrients, they take the nutrients from the blood vessels, they give it to the neurons, they recycle some of the small molecules or some of the small messages between the neurons and each other. They help maintain a proper microenvironment for the neuron to function. Right, so you're meaning that like let's say astrocyte is not working properly so also neuron will not work uh, accordingly right yes exactly yeah so you mentioning in here astrocyte is a very important uh, important cells uh, to support neurons work yes okay and so what happened like in, in case of modern neuron disease so uh, how is it related to motor neuron disease and astrocyte? Yeah, it's a very good question. So we know in motor neuron disease, what happened is we have two things actually. So the first thing, because astrocytes have also an immune wall, they fight any inflammation that is in the brain. Mm -hmm. So when there is a lot of stress in this environment, what happened is two things. The first thing is the astrocytes stop providing support for neurons. Right. So they stop the recycling function. Mm -hmm. They stop taking up the excess 
messages from from between the neurons so there is an accumulation of these messages between the neurons mm. which make the neurons constantly feel that they need to keep their function and keep firing right something that we call excitotoxicity because the neurons as long as the messages these messages are there mm-hmm. they will keep on firing and they will keep on doing the function right. so they don't get to rest at all mm-hmm. which affect them badly mm. this is one thing the second thing is astrocytes they are very supportive but they have a very dark side as well like what so basically in als in motor neuron disease we know that they become toxic mm-hmm. so not also not only they withdraw their support But yeah. they themselves start to be toxic to neurons. So they start to secrete cytokines and chemokines, inflammatory signals right. to neurons, mm-hmm. which does not help at all. If anything, it exacerbates mm-hmm. the progression of the disease. Right. So that's the problem we're having is that the supporting cells start not to be supporting anymore. They right. even become toxic right. to the neurons as well. So this is something that is very important to research because mm-hmm. we need to know what well, it's the switch why did the suicide decided to switch sides and yes, that way exactly. and how can we take it back to being the the mm-hmm. nice supporting cells to the neurons yes because even if you try to cure the neurons as long as it's getting this toxic signal from the astrocytes mm. we're not going to get anywhere yeah right good so um as i understand that like astrocyte is also r- uh, playing a key role in modern neuron disease What do you think uh, in that research arena is going to happen in the next probably few years or maybe a decade? I so. think there is a lot of potential. Do you mean for astrocytes in particular or for the research of motor neuron disease? So, I mean, role of astrocyte in motor neuron disease. I think now there are a lot more people interested in studying astrocytes mm-hmm. and understanding their contribution to the disease. People are now also interested to finding, uh, as I said, like targets in astrocytes that we can then manipulate or restore their function in mm. some way so that we can get them to the good side rather than the dark side. I think right. that's, I think it goes hand in hand, like as we're researching neurons and trying to understand what is going on with the proteins, with the signals, with the RNA not being in its correct place and all of these things. We need to also think about the supporting cells mm. and how we can make them function properly. Together, I think that would help us massively in right. finding a proper drug for for ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases as well. Okay, I as you mentioned about a uh, proper drug. So what kind of uh treatment would be suitable for uh for motor neuron disease like it could be like as you mentioned is as a protein. So do you think that would be a inhibitors uh, kind of things that you can block uh, that f- some function or can activate the protein structure? So uh, what kind of drugs could be? I mean, just is a hypothetical question. So what do you think? I think it's a very, very good question. I can tell you from what is around now, we've got one drug that inhibits, like it inhibits the function of a receptor on the neurons. Mm. As I said, the neurons, when... the astrocytes stop clearing up the small messages between the neurons there is a build up of these messages we call mm. it a neurotransmitters and the neurons keeps on thinking oh i need to keep working right. so they, it's like they work non stop to the point that they get a burnout mm-hmm. so then you need to block the receptors that receive those messages signal. so yeah. that you can understand or the signal exactly so mm. they understand oh now we can switch off yeah so this is one of the drugs that is available and have been used since the 1993 already uh, is FDA approved yes this one is the one of the drugs that is FDA approved okay. to so that's an in, we call it an inhibitor because right. it inhibits the function or of the of the receptor basically it occupies the space mm. through which the signal should have been sitting on the receptor rather we fill that space mm. with this drug right this is one of them there is another actually very interesting area of research now which is antisense oligonucleotides okay what is that <laughs> basically it's a small strands of letters mm-hmm. that have the same letters as the letters in the dna exactly so just like a code like a code yeah it's a small sequence of a code yeah and if you remember we were talking about proteins not working properly proteins mm. misfolding or aggregating yeah not just tdp43 that aggregates there are other proteins that mm. aggregates one of them is sod1 
which is one of the genes we know that it accounts for around 20% of familial cases of ALS, but yeah. it's also been reported the sporadic ALS as well. Right. Yeah. And so essentially what happens is that if you have a mutation in that gene, mm -hmm. the, the product of that gene, which is the protein, will not be working properly. Right. And it will have more propensity and tendency to aggregate. And mm -hmm. we know aggregates in the cell is not good. Not good, yeah. So what do we need to do is that we need to stop the this gene from making those aggregated uh, proteins. Yeah. So then when you have the DNA, when there is a small copy of it, which mm -hmm. is the RNA, this antisense oligonucleotide or ASOs yeah. bind to the small RNA yeah. and degrade that small RNA. Right. So you no longer get the misfolded protein mm -hmm. or the aggregates. And in that way, you remove the stress of the cell of having to deal with a form of aggregates right. in the cell. And this actually now has been used in clinical trials. It's called Tofficern. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the, I think, promising. How hopeful you are. Well, honestly, especially like, I think we need to start having more like a precision medicine. So it will be targeted toward the mutations that we characterize. Right. And we make drugs or therapies that are directed toward each specific mutation or misfolding or a problem that is happening in the cell. So that's why it's very important to understand exactly what is going on wrong in these cells at a very cellular, molecular level right. to be able to come up with these sort of therapies. All right. It's very interesting. As we talked about, about therapy, so my next question is that how manageable the motor neuron disease for a patient's perspective? What do you think? I know of us, you are not a medical doctor, yeah. but like, I just want to know your opinion. What do you think is... I think they are one of the most courageous people you will ever meet mm. uh, in your life. And it's really an honor to be working with them mm. to trying to find uh, a drug uh, for, for this disease. It's not easy yeah. to, within a very short span of time, mm. to be losing function. Normal things that we do, like waking, when you don't think about like waking up, going yeah, for a walk. Yeah, I can think about it, yeah. Like it's just things that we do without thinking, but that would require a lot of work from mm. someone with motor neuron disease, a different kind of setup yeah. for them to be able to have some fresh air or go on about their days or be around their loved ones. Yeah. So it's really, I think it's, it's a very, 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 very tough disease. Disease, and I really hope we a, can find a solution, probably a drug can. to it very, very soon because yeah, that will help a lot of people. Yeah, and it will improve uh, the quality of uh, life of the people yes. who are affected. Yeah, definitely, it's a rare disease, and probably not, uh, not so many people probably affected um, by this disease, but. Still, I feel it's really highly important task to find a treatment for motor neuron disease. Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. Okay, cool. I learned a lot of, uh, about <laughs> motor neuron disease. Hopefully, my audience also uh, learned a lot of things from you. Do I? <laughs> Thank you. Before wrapping up, do you have anything you want to share to my audience uh, about motor neuron disease? Um, I would just ask people whenever they can if you found surveys online because mm. sometimes we need data not just from patients we also need data as i said we need to have a comparison right so that comparison is always against healthy people mm. so if you found survey that asking you about like certain questions or lifestyle things please take part in these surveys very important yes. to get the information yes. and to get the right approach to treat uh, uh, uh the disease yeah. right this is how we can all, we all making our very, very tiny contributions. Yeah. And this could be one of those things, which is actually a very big contribution. Yeah, but uh, that, you know what? Like we receive a lot of um, uh, survey uh, email and we often uh, like ignore those emails. So my, I'm telling to my audience, if you say any kind of survey email, please uh, try to respond, try to spend some time to read and probably to contribute uh, for for that research, if you see uh, this kind of email, especially modern neuron disease. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Dwe, uh, for your insightful conversation to our listeners. And uh, 
to be oh. honest. I, I didn't have any idea about modern urine disease, so I learned a lot of from you. Thank you so much for coming to Cyport Chat. Thank you all the people who is listening Cyport Chat. We talk science and let's know science together. Until next time, stay curious, stay inspired and stay tuned for more exciting conversation right here on your favorite Cyport Chat. Thank you. Bye-bye.